This is a story of the Paris Peace Conference that followed World War I. It's a story of aspirations, schemes, farces, and tragedies, and the collision of two irresistible forces, Woodrow Wilson's idealism and the real politic of Europe's old order. The setting is Paris, not gay Paris as we knew it, but a shell-shocked city, in the words of one delegate, gashed to her very soul. <laughs> pressures and crises of everyday life, we tend to forget our past, the events that shaped our lives but which now survive as a faint memory or a rusty statue barely noticed. One such event was the First World War. create a permanent peace. It is also the moment in time that begins our series. We now have the benefit of time and perspective to examine the crucial period that begins with the Paris Peace Conference and ends with Pearl Harbor. As we look back with the aid of historians and eyewitnesses, we realize that the course of our lives was preordained by the handling of international affairs in the 1920s and 30s. We thought it fitting to start our series in the John Quincy Adams Room of the State Department. It was on this desk that the Treaty of Paris was signed in 1783. That treaty officially ended the American Revolution and broke our ties with the old world. In his farewell address, George Washington had warned against entangling foreign alliances, and that tradition had endured ever since. It would not be easy to overturn. These State Department reception rooms are filled with similar memorabilia related to American history, and they serve as graphic reminders of mistakes made, opportunities lost, triumphs, as well as tragedies. This first program is a story of a president determined to end that hallowed isolationist tradition of American foreign policy and the tragedy that resulted. It was a cold, gray morning when the George Washington eased out of New York Harbor President Woodrow Wilson was her most distinguished passenger, sailing on a crucial mission, 
to negotiate in his terms a just and lasting peace and to establish a new world order to prevent war, a mission which to Woodrow Wilson was sacred. The president was jaunty and full of optimism. He believed in divine providence that he had been chosen to dictate the terms of peace. He surrounded himself with enthusiastic men who shared his vision. Fight for what is right, he told them, and I will support you. For his peace team, he gathered about him an impressive group of scholars and experts, the best and the brightest of 1918. Among them, Professor Charles Seymour of Yale, his leading academic advisor. James Shotwell of Columbia, a leader in the American peace movement. William Bullitt, idealistic young diplomat, and later our first ambassador to the Soviet Union. Henry White, an aging though able diplomat, the only Republican on the peace team. Secretary of State Robert Lansing was included merely as a formality. Wilson believed the president ruled absolute in foreign affairs, and this was his own special mission. In his words, peace without victory. The First World War, however, left no victors. America's leading diplomat historian, Professor George Kennan. It was a terrible war, as we all remember it, or those of us who are old enough. It went on for four years. I believe some eight million young men, the flower of Europe's youth, were killed in that war. And bear in mind that no civilization has any asset comparable in value to those eight million men who were killed at that time. I mean, there were none of the issues of the war, nothing that people were trying to achieve, nothing they hoped to achieve in their wildest ambitions, which could have justified this sacrifice and slaughter of these young men. And it took the heart out of these countries because it was not just the young men who went to their death or were maimed or wounded or shell-shocked, but it was also their families who were discouraged. And these countries were never the same afterwards. The sight of the victors, thousands of them returning home as refugees in a destroyed land, went largely unrecorded in the United States. The American view of France was a stage set for the entrance of Woodrow Wilson. Paris gave President Wilson a welcome that would have warmed the heart of a Caesar or a Napoleon. It was as if the Messiah had arrived. Professor Robin Winks of Yale. Wilson was very messianic. He felt that the American role had always been that we were a city set upon a hill that others would wish to imitate. He was a person who felt a great conviction that he himself could change history, could move history, and that some of the presidents who had preceded him had not been sufficiently moral, and that he was going to inject old elements in a new guise of morality into American foreign policy. The cheering confirmed Wilson's view that he alone would shape the peace. Again, Professor George Kennan. Poor Wilson. He was a man who made great mistakes, primarily when he was forced to do things that he didn't really understand or believe in. And he had warned earlier in the war, before we entered the war, against the dangers of a punitive peace. And yet, in 1918, 1919, when the war came to an end, he was tired. He didn't like to, to take a stand alone against uh, our former allies. He realized they had suffered a good deal during the war. So he did what he did not want to do and associated himself with the deliberations at Versailles. And I think this was very unfortunate. Versailles, the elegant residence of King Louis XIV. Here in 1871, Germany had dictated peace terms to the French. Now France would repay the humiliation. Soon the Hall of Mirrors would be crowded with men who matured in the 19th century, when international affairs were guided by the bloodlines of royalty. President Wilson wanted to end the old system of alliances, power balances, and secret diplomacy. That would be difficult in Paris, which one delegate described as a psychotic city where everyone was morbid. The symbol of French hostility and bitterness was its 77-year-old Prime Minister, Georges Clemenceau. He had one great love, France, and one great hate, Germany. 
British Prime Minister Lloyd George brought his mistress and a desire to trade with Germany. The chaos of Versailles would leave an indelible impression on future world leaders. Winston Churchill was there as Britain's Minister of War, and he was appalled at how unprepared the peacemakers were. Prince Faisal of Arabia was there with the mysterious Lawrence. Whatever unity Lawrence had welded among the Arabs was shattered by the secret agreements between European powers. A young revolutionist from French Indochina was there to seek a Bill of Rights for his people. He requested an audience with President Wilson and was refused. His name was Ho Chi Minh. Young Herbert Hoover was in Belgium administering the food relief program there. The future world leader who would have to pay dearly years later for the failings of Versailles was President Wilson's vigorous young assistant secretary of the Navy, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Relegated to a military mission, he nonetheless witnessed close up the diplomatic cynicism that disembodied Germany. In Germany, a violent power struggle between moderate and radical Bolsheviks erupted in Berlin. It was called the Spartacus Revolt, and it threatened the fragile new democratic regime in that country. Since the Russian Revolution in 1917, communism had threatened to sweep Europe. The German army crushed the Spartacus uprisings in January 1919, just as the peace conference was opening. The final peace settlement would be shaped by the personalities of Wilson, Clemenceau, Lloyd George, and Orlando. But another name must be added, the name of one of the most mysterious figures in American politics, Wilson's personal advisor, Colonel Edward M. House of Texas. Colonel House was a Texas politician who relied on shrewdness and manipulation to get his way. As a child, he contracted malaria and never regained vigorous health. Guile took the place of strength in House's personality. He preferred to work behind the scenes. A quiet family man, he became Woodrow Wilson's personal advisor and friend. When they first met, Wilson took to him immediately. He is my second personality, said Wilson, my alter ego. His thoughts and mine are one. Colonel House reached new heights in Paris as one of America's five peace delegates. He was secretly proud that he had a larger staff than either the Secretary of State or the President. Operating from a secure power base, Colonel House was the only person in Paris who enjoyed the president's confidence. The president was optimistic when he left temporarily for the United States to take care of domestic matters. His coveted League of Nations was now part of the peace treaty. He placed all his faith in it, and all his trust in Colonel House, who would handle the delicate negotiations while he was away. Woodrow Wilson returned to a post-war America that was undergoing a revolution in values and behavior. It had become fashionable to scoff at religion, respectability, reformers, and politicians. People were talking about Sigmund Freud, the ego, and the libido. An artistic rebellion was also underway in America. One of the advanced signals was the New York Armory Show of 1913, the first display of modern art in the United States. It was viewed with both delight and disgust. An outrageous painting, Marcel Duchamp's nude descending a staircase, stole the show, causing former President Teddy Roosevelt to dismiss the proceedings as caveman art. Nevertheless, modern art had arrived in America. When the George Washington left New York Harbor for Wilson's return to France in early March, there was no pomp or display. The president played shuffleboard with his doctor, Admiral Kerry Grayson, who worried about Wilson's health. The Senate had just issued a dictum that the peace treaty was unacceptable in its present form. It dealt a severe blow to the president's peace hopes, and he took it personally. Colonel House carried on negotiations in Paris while Woodrow Wilson was away in the United States. He was convinced that compromise with Clemenceau was not only necessary, but inevitable. In his offices at the Hotel Creon, House held secret meetings with Clemenceau and Lloyd George. 
His main drive was to wrap up the peace treaty with Germany as soon as possible. And this required compromise. When Wilson arrived in France and found out what House had done, he was shocked. Professor Arthur Link of Princeton. House egregiously betrayed Wilson by, in fact, uh, giving away his whole program, or virtually his whole program agreeing to things that Wilson was fighting against adamantly, for example, the establishment of an independent republic of the Rhine, agreeing to shelve the League of, the League of Nations. Wilson was aghast when he returned and found what House had done, and for obvious reasons, he simply could not have the confidence in him in the future that he had had in the past. Having lost faith in Colonel House, the president still could not turn to his secretary of state. Wilson and Robert Lansing were not on good terms. Lansing had serious differences with the president about the war. He was a hawk and wanted to enter the war sooner. Lansing was a pragmatic lawyer, a realist. Wilson thought he was unimaginative and suspected his loyalty. Lansing did not put much faith in the League of Nations. He did not believe it would solve international conflicts. President Wilson never forgave him for that, and at Versailles ignored and humiliated his Secretary of State. The embittered Lansing passed his time in Paris drawing sketches and doodling. Even in his isolation, Lansing was fascinated with the grand old man of France, the cynical, tough Clemenceau. With regard to Germany, Clemenceau had two goals, French security and revenge. He was puzzled by Wilson's idealism. After all, France had been saved by bayonets, not by words. The strain and confusion of the peace conference intensified. In the words of one delegate, it was like a riot in a parrot house. There was the machine gun rattle of a million typewriters, the incessant shrilling of telephones, the cold voices of interpreters, and behind it all, the ache and exhaustion of despair. At one point, Clemenceau called Wilson a pro-German. Wilson stood his ground, insisting that the League of Nations would prevent future German aggression. Clemenceau scoffed at the proud Wilson, who, he said, talked like Jesus Christ, but acted like Lloyd George. Influenza, a new and unexpected element, surfaced in Paris. It was an unusually virulent strain which had reached pandemic proportions in the winter of 1918. In one year, influenza claimed 25 million lives, more than the total number of deaths in World War I. In Paris, another wave of influenza struck in February, killing 2,500 victims that month. On the afternoon of April 3rd, Woodrow Wilson became a victim. A New York neurosurgeon studying newly available papers has uncovered a startling possibility. Dr. Edwin Weinstein. We now know that the virus did not simply attack the respiratory uh, tract, but actually involved uh, uh, many organs, the gastrointestinal system, uh, the heart, uh, and the brain. And the probability is uh, that Wilson, in the course of his illness, also suffered uh, some brain inflammation. This was a particularly serious matter because Wilson had a history of cerebral vascular disease for a number of years. The fever-wracked president was confined to this room for five days. Wilson's illness threatened to break up the peace conference. Admiral Grayson nervously fended off questions from reporters like John Nevins of the International News Service. The American Message Center was swamped with inquiries. The president was forced to rely heavily on Colonel House, an odd choice considering their recent differences, but Wilson had no one else to turn to. Clemenceau and Lloyd George met in Woodrow Wilson's study, while the dutiful Colonel House shuttled messages back and forth to the president's bedroom. It was the most crucial time of the peace conference. Wilson and the Allies were at an impasse over war reparations and the occupation of Germany. Now, encephalitis uh, 
is known to cause changes in personality, uh, alterations in mood, and even delusions. And there was a striking change in the president's mood following this brief but acute illness. Uh, formerly, he had uh, resisted many of the French demands. Now he seemed much more willing to compromise. And Wilson developed a rather euphoric state in which uh, he uh, seemed to uh, greatly exaggerate the efficacy of his actions, thinking he'd actually won a great victory when, as a matter of fact, it was a compromise. The crafty Clemenceau and the clever Lloyd George had won out. Wilson's world seemed to collapse around him. Italy's Prime Minister Orlando walked out of the peace conference when Wilson refused to give Italy the Adriatic seaport Fiume. Wilson ultimately compromised on the Japanese demand for Shantung province in Manchuria, but said no to an issue that was emotionally far more volatile. Professor Edwin O. Reischauer of Harvard. The Japanese also thought that there ought to be an element in it about racial equality. And they put this concept forth. And Wilson managed to just brush it aside as being too embarrassing for the white Western nations that dominated the world. And they would not accept the Japanese concept of racial equality, which was a rather s dangerous sign of what was going to come later. On June 28, 1919, the victors and the vanquished gathered at the Palace of Versailles to sign the Paris Peace Treaty, officially ending World War I. The Treaty of Versailles was a severe peace treaty. It forced Germany to admit war guilt, disarmed her, stripped her of her colonies, and demanded war reparations in the billions of dollars, which would be impossible to pay. The issues were decided in private meetings where stubborn demands for territory outweighed any principle of justice. We tend to view Versailles as a hall full of people rushing about in search of peace. In truth, they found calamity. Professor Robin Winks of Yale. There's no question that the Peace of Versailles is one of the many remote causes of World War II in the sense that the reparations extracted from Germany were so punitive that the German people had every reason to be deeply resentful about the peace. The Germans were able to argue that they had not been fully defeated in war, but rather had been defeated in politics. And it gave rise to the feeling that the German army had been betrayed. A young corporal wounded in the war vowed to avenge what he later called a stab in the back of Versailles. His name was Adolf Hitler. Germany, stripped of honor, was blockaded during the peace negotiations. No food was available until a treaty was signed. And in one of history's gratuitous cruelties, the blockade of Germany continued for two more weeks. Thousands of Germans died of starvation. The bitterness would be long remembered. An ideal treaty was an impossible goal. The passions and hatreds of World War I were too strong. The obstacles Wilson faced were insurmountable. But compromise proved fatal. If one extreme or the other had won out, the results might have been longer lasting. A tougher, more ruthless peace of conquest might have kept Germany down. A more just and liberal peace might have averted the conditions in Germany that encouraged Hitler. In the end, the Germans blamed Woodrow Wilson for the Versailles Treaty. The German government said, President Wilson is a hypocrite. The Versailles Treaty is the vilest crime in history. We must never forget it is only a scrap of paper. Do not lose hope the day of resurrection comes. After all, with Russia withdrawn into revolution and Austria-Hungary broken up, Germany remained the only cohesive people in Central Europe. The victor can have vengeance or he may have peace, but he cannot have both. The statesmen of Paris succeeded only in planting the seeds of war.